so this show and this exhibit is about images and wimages. And a lot of people aren't very comfortable with either of these genres. Certainly icons are unfamiliar to many people. And then whimsical images, which we shorten to whimage, is really about that element of perception. So they say art is visual philosophy. That is, we express what we believe about who we are and why we are here through our art. But just like language, if you don't know the visual language, you won't understand what you're looking at. I went to graduate school and they said, express yourself. And I said, I got nothing. I thought you were going to teach me. Oh, we don't want to mess with your artistic expression. Just express yourself. I said, well, if this were a German class and you told me to express myself, I'd say, I don't know German. I need vocabulary. I need syntax. I need grammar. The same is true for painting. You need a context to understand visual languages. So this is about visual languages. Um, so let's begin. Let's see if this works. Do I go down? Do I go across? Mm, let's see. Oh, they do work now. Good. All right. So when we talk about visual language, throughout history, people have expressed themselves. And visual spoken languages have, if you don't understand the language, you can understand the sounds. You can understand the character, the personality. So when we hear... Russian, for instance, it falls on our ears a certain way, or Spanish, or Chinese. Different languages have their own personality and character, as does artwork. But they also have content. They have a message. And here we see women, and it looks like they're hunting. Not exactly sure why, but it's an old drawing. The Egyptians, now they were a very sophisticated culture, and we see that in their art form. So... We look and we say, okay, they have this symbolic reference emphasizing uh, importance by scale. They combine flat. First of all, it's a two-dimensional surface. They maintain that integrity. They use words, uh, so they combine words and images. And this we have as a frontal, as if you were facing you, and then a profile put together. But the third thing you'll notice is the eye is frontal too. So they were very sophisticated in their expression about communicating what's important, what's significant. We go up to the, the Greeks, and of course the Greeks were into mythology, they were into philosophy, they were into uh, mathematics, logic, all kinds of things. So that characterized their style of art. And then of course the Impressionists, big jump, but uh, also a big jump in philosophy. The Expressionists were at the same time as the Existentialists. And the Existentialists thought mm, their big idea was there's no big ideas. There's only existence. There's what is happening to me now. And that is reflected in the art form of the Impressionists. How does light fall on my eyeball? So these are some of the things that you need to know when you're looking at artwork. Otherwise, you'll miss what they're trying to tell you. And that is especially important when we go to the next slide, which is Kandinsky. Kandinsky was Russian, great artist that opened up a new world. He says, art does not have to copy nature. Art can be something. Almost like music. We don't say, oh, that looks like a tree or that looks like a person. We feel music. We experience music. So he said, why not with art? And so he opened up the non-objective art. Now, if you're looking for trying to figure out what is it, you'd miss what he's trying to tell you. So you need to know the language. And then, of course, Mondrian took it to the extreme, and that is we'll work with the building blocks of art, line, shape primary colors. And uh, then we have the drip paintings by Jackson Pollock. And again, these there's a video that came out in uh, the 70s called The Shock of the New. 
And what they're pointing out was that art began to take on, it had a cultural dimension, but it had to be new and different. And uh, so whether or not it was real art or whether it was just new and different, uh, that's left up for history to decide. Jackson Pollock, though, he, he was a revolutionary and he also did very good work. Now, how do you appreciate it? How do you know? You have to learn to feel. You have to learn to open your heart and your mind to something a little different and say, maybe, maybe, let's see what's going on here. And when you do that, sometimes you'll think or experience and you'll say, well, I'm not buying it. Like the conceptual artist who got on the plane in New York with a bottle of air and then released it in San Francisco. I don't know if that qualifies as art. So we can be critical but we have to be open at the same time. Then Liechtenstein, he took elements, go back to that Egyptian painting we saw. What was important about that? That they maintain the integrity of the two-dimensional surface. Very important. Because that is what the Byzantines used to create their liturgical art. Now, Dostoevsky, Everybody's heard of Dostoevsky, said, beauty will save the world. And I thought, that's a nice saying. I'm an artist. I can appreciate that. So I thought it was a positive saying until I began to think about it for a while. And I thought, maybe it wasn't so positive. Beauty will save the world. Why? Because our hearts will have grown cold to God. That we will no longer believe in the transcendent that there won't be that relationship of faith and it will be reduced to experience. So when someone sees beauty, they'll experience something transcendent, something beyond the physical to something spiritual. And I think we're getting close to that in in our society, in our culture. So perhaps beauty will save the world. It will take us back to that element of the transcendent. Now, If we look at modern society, how does modern society transcend the physical? Well, you have the the IG, um, CIG of Harry Potter and Iron Man and all these movies that make the non-material magical. And that is fantastic and it's great human imagination, but it tells us it's not real. And then on the other hand, you have from the point of view of uh, the Renaissance and Romantic painters, things that come out sentimental. They make the spiritual sentimental with fat cherubs and angels and things like that. They have spiritual feelings, but it makes it remote, unreal again. Then you have the Byzantine. Now, the Byzantine to Western eyes is a very mm, expressive almost like a folk art. But if you look and see, there's those elements that we talked about with the Egyptian art, the idea of symbolism. Here's the center axis, the two main figures, most important figures, the Virgin Mary and Christ on the central axis. We see the Virgin Mary, she's a head taller than the apostles. We're not saying she was an Amazon, we're saying that she's more important. She has a halo. They don't have halos, this is the ascension. Pentecost is coming. They will have halos, but the Paniya has a halo. Well, the Virgin Mary has a halo because the Holy Spirit descended upon her at the Annunciation, which we'll be celebrating in a week or two, and that is she bore the Son of God. So her, and here's a symbolic use of color, her humanity, red for humanity, was wrapped in God's divinity at the descent of the Holy Spirit. So she has a halo, and that halo has a burning bush around it. See all the symbolism hidden in there? The burning bush was where it was on fire but was not consumed. The Virgin Mary is on fire but not consumed. We receive the body and blood of Christ in the divine liturgy. We're on fire but not consumed. Then you see that the apostles are stacked up on each other. And that's how children draw. They're artists. They're trying to tell you a story, and they want to tell you the best story. So based on importance, we see 
the biggest person in the picture is Yaya, because Yaya, Grandma, makes cookies. The dog is on the roof. What's the dog doing on the roof? I don't know. He just felt like putting the dog on the roof. So we create and we stack the apostles up on top of each other because we want to see what's important. The artist, too, they're very sophisticated. They knew how to draw. They created figures. The faces don't look like people that we see, but that's not what's important. The point, point is that they, they borrow from nature. We're not const, const, uh, constricted to nature, but we see their people, their faces. It's an expressive art form. But you see up here, this really shows their sophistication. This hand in front of the mandili. The mandili is God's glory. So Christ is in his glory in the ascension. This hand behind. They made it translucent. Very clever. And then this icon is the icon that combines east and west. Here we have that eastern look, frontality, expressive eyes. Here we have something new, the western look, that creation of space, that modeling of form. Icons are flat. We don't have atmosphere in them. They come out towards you. But with western imagery, it creates atmosphere. It uses perspective to create distance. So the Byzantines don't do that. They do take the modeling of form, the classical poses, but then they borrow the large expressive eyes. So this liturgical language is perfect for the church because it is the most effective art form to help us transcend the physical. Because it doesn't have, it doesn't try to influence you with emotions or, or make you feel a certain way. It's you and the image. And then that's where the communication begins. You can't escape the image. Wherever you go, the eyes follow you. So that is, in, in a nutshell, what makes up Byzantine iconography, how it works. Now, one person didn't sit down and figure this all out and publish a book and say, okay, get to work. It was a culture, and it developed over centuries, and even now. Young people around the world, especially with the use of social media, are learning and feeding off of each other. Does everything I create belong in the canon of Byzantine iconography? No, it never did. The church judges. The church decides. The church keeps what it recognizes, and it rejects the rest. So in iconography, architecture, music, iconography, Liturgical text, it all has a purpose, and it all is rooted in the physical to bring us into the spiritual. And the Byzantines know the soul. They know that we don't, we don't resonate with romantic, uh, sentimental images. Real life is much more dynamic and perhaps vital. And so in the iconography, it's very stark, but the architecture is designed in a certain way to make present the kingdom of God. So once they figured out some of the architectural, solved some of the architectural problems, they came up with a dome. And the dome on a cruciform church, dome and a cross, that's the most common one. They started out with basilicas because that reflected the Vasiliki, the king, the architecture where the king had his power. But now we have the kingdom of heaven. So the dome is the heavens. The square is the earth. So we meld those two images together, the dome and the square, and you have heavenly and earthly. And this is the kingdom of God on earth. We think incarnationally. So here we see Christ. This is a church I painted in Augusta, Georgia years ago, 1997 to 99. And the layout of the church evolved. It didn't just start out this way, but it evolved over time and until the whole understanding of what this is, what is going on. And we know it took centuries because we had ecumenical councils. We had disagreements. We had heresies. We had to figure out what does this mean that the second person of the Trinity took on flesh and dwelt among us. 
And here we see Christ's blessing. With his right hand, he spells out his name, I-C-X-C. His left hand, he holds the book of the Gospels. He has red and blue, divinity and humanity. And this is talking, this is a verse from Isaiah that the bishop says right before the epistle, talking about this Eucharistic community. Lord, Lord, look down from heaven and visit. And behold, this vineyard which your right hand has planted and you have established takes a lot to keep up the four walls of a church. And local people know that. This is hard, but this is sacred. This is a place where we experience God. Dr. Sankiran says, we don't, we don't go to church to see God. We go to church to be seen by God. And here we have the all-powerful, the Pandukrata, the beginning of time, Christ looking down on us. Next order of created beings is angels, archangels, cherubim, teraphim, the bodiless powers. And then below that we have the, that's a close-up of Christ. And below that we have the prophets, patriarchs, and fathers of the church. And then when you come down into the church, those, those triangles that join the round to the square are called pendentives. They support the dome, but they're also the foundation of the church the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Another architectural feature that expresses the theology of the church is the apse behind the altar. We remember that the first Christians were Jews, and the Jews had a cult of worship. They would go to the synagogue. They would pray. They would read scripture. They would sing. They would preach. This is their cult of worship. So they didn't have to reinvent that. What was added to it was the Last Supper, the mystical supper. And that's how we experience worship today. So our roots go all the way back there. And the temple itself, the Holy of Holies, and that's where we celebrate the divine liturgy and the sacrifice, the bloodless sacrifice. And in the apse we have the Virgin Mary. In our poetry, we say she is the ladder on which God descended. She took flesh. He took flesh from the Virgin Mary. She connected the heavens and the earth. She had held within her the uncontainable. So we call her the platitera, ton uranon, more expansive than the heavens. And this is in Ocurida, Hagia Sophia. And you'll see the different levels, the different registries. So depending, every church is different. Architecture is different. So you have to decorate it appropriately. And the more you know, the more you can, the deeper you can express the profoundness of what has taken place. Here we have Christ giving his body and blood to the apostles. And then below, the bishops of the church. And these are the vestments of the bishop, very similar to the priest at this time. Now they wear what's called a sacco with bells on it. But the only difference here between a priest's vestments and a bishop's vestment is the omophorium, the vestment that goes around the shoulder indicating that they are the shepherd of the church, carrying the lamb on their shoulders. This is uh, Christ giving his body and blood to the apostles, and this is at uh, Studenica Monastery the chapel of Joachim and Anna. So we don't, I'll go through this kind of quickly so you get the idea, uh, but it's all very well thought out, and it's a visual language that translates into experience. It shapes us. It forms us. It helps us to experience the kingdom of God on earth. Um, we don't have blank walls. I go into some Baptist churches, and I think, hmm, there's a lot we could do here. But they aren't, into icons. Icons don't mean the same thing to them. Uh, but in our church, they're essential because they are our relatives. They are our family. They are our history. And so we put up those images uh, because death is not the end. Death is a door we all go through. And so we are surrounded by our family, by the church triumphant. And uh, so, so time and space uh, come together in the church. And here we have the icon screen which separates the nave from the Holy of Holies. And here we have the Virgin Mary with Christ as a child representing the incarnation. And over here we have Christ Pandocrator rec representing the, the return, 
when he comes again. So in between the incarnation and his return is the church celebrating his body and blood. And that is carrying on the ministry that he began until he comes again. And you can see this in various iterations. This is in Stavronikita Monastery on Mount Athos. And you'll see they have it more elaborate. They have the 12 major feasts up here. And then they have the crucifixion with the Virgin Mary and John. And then on the wall, they have the Annunciation of the Virgin Mary. And that's important because they developed the program of the church with giving hierarchy to certain, certain elements and aspects of the church. So the very top registry is about the 12 major feast days. So we'll see that. This is Osius Lucas, just outside of Athens. It's a monastery, ninth century monastery, a very beautiful church. Okay? All right, so behind the altar, anything that has to do with the divine liturgy, we have icons relating to the divine liturgy. Uh, in this icon, we three, see it's the hospitality of Abraham, so we see the three angels, and we see uh, that this tells us a lot about the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity, we discovered God is one, but God is three persons at the baptism of Christ. So here we have two angels bowing to the third angel. So here we have Christ in the red and blue, and here we have the Holy Spirit, and they are of one essence. You see they're all wearing a dark blue garment. And then we have personifications behind them of the building, the trees, and that should be a rock, but that would be the Holy Spirit, the Son, the tree of life, and then the temple, the Father. The Say it again. The hospitality of Abraham. Hus hospitality of Abraham. That was when the three angels visited uh, Abraham and Sarah to tell Sarah that she was going to bear a son. And she laughed. And he says, why did you laugh? And he says, I'm old. And they said, well, don't you believe me? You're going to bear a son. Well, those three angels then went on uh, to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham had, had a dialogue with the angels saying, if, if you find 50 righteous people, if you find 40, if you find 30, if you find five, he got them all the way down, and, but they couldn't find five righteous people. So they were destroyed. Okay, so, so you get the idea that iconography, it both teaches and it makes you experience. Okay? In this icon of the Yenisis, the birth of Christ, we see lots of those kind of symbolic elements. Here is the darkness, the cave, and Christ is wrapped in grave clothes and placed in a tomb. So that's foretelling why he came in the first place. We see from Isaiah, the ox and the ass recognized their master. The Jews didn't recognize him, but the ox and the ass recognized him. And they minister to Christ. We see the Virgin Mary by herself and Joseph set off aside with a little worried look on his face, saying, you know, if, if they discover she's pregnant and unmarried, they're going to destroy her. So he was contemplating, I will put her away quietly because he was a righteous man. So a lot of elements go into these images that cover space and time. It's one event, but we have the visitation of the Magi. We have uh, uh, Salomone and the midwife giving Christ a bath. That was the daughter of Joseph. Because uh, he was an elderly man, more of a caretaker for the Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary has three stars on her, uh, one on her helmet and one on each shoulder, saying virgin before birth, during birth, after birth, symbol of the Holy Trinity. It's just loaded with symbolism. Um, and, and the more you understand, the richer it is and the deeper and more profound it is. The visitation of the uh, Magi, the shepherds, the angels, the star. It's all present. So that's the didactic side. From the aesthetic side, to help us experience the today, because the hymnography of the church says, Simeron Christosianate, today Christ was born. Remember, we transcended time and space when we walked in the church. We are present with God now. So this is a now moment. So we experience that by maintaining the flatness of the two-dimensional object and we come out towards the viewer. That is, we use reverse perspective to include you in the image. And remember I said earlier about 
a transcendent experience. It's not telling you, just telling you a story. It's helping you experience that story. So here we have Christ uh, enthroned, the Virgin Mary and John. Now, sometimes you'll see that by itself, just a, a they sees icon. And that is a symbol, shorthand for the return of Christ, the last judgment. So here we have the apostles, the 12 apostles sitting on their thrones, the choirs of angels. We have here the ever ready throne, that is the cross, the tools of salvation, the cross, the spear, the sponge, the Bible. Here's the Holy Spirit, the nails. We have Adam and Eve worshiping, and this is the river of fire. Those who are assigned to hell, and then here is the choir of the righteous. Okay, so these are icons by my teacher, who was Costa Futiades, a great painter, and it just shows his particular style. So I want to say a few words, because tomorrow's the restoration of icons. It's the first Sunday of Orthodox Lent when we celebrate. Uh, the restoration of icons. So in order for something to be restored, it means it had to be removed. So in 736, King Leo the Emperor, the Assyrian, outlawed icons. You know, it was a, he knew it was a risky move. Uh, it would not be popular, so he did it step by step, increments. So he took down the icon of Christ from Halki Gate to measure the uproar. And there was an uproar. But he felt strong, so he plowed ahead. So for 150 years, icons were outlawed. They were destroyed. They were burned. People were persecuted. They tried to wipe them out. Why did he do that? Well, he was raised and influenced by a Muslim culture that said, icons are idols. We have no idols before God. So St. John of Damascus and St. Theodore of the Studite, they thought about this. They said, mm, I don't think so. I don't think icons are just allowed in the Orthodox Church. I think they're essential. They are an integral part of our faith because the second person of the Trinity took on flesh and dwelt among us. He had a prosopon, he had a face. We could see him, we could touch him. We can't, we haven't seen God, we can't, the Father, we can't depict him. We represent them symbolically with the uh, Three angels. But Christ we could see. So they used an incarnational argument to explain that, yes, we can have icons. We need icons. They are a part of our faith. We don't worship them. We worship God alone. But we reverence them. And the hypostatic nature of the person, meaning the personality, the person is represented through the face. Same thing with our relatives. We keep a picture of our wife or our grandkids in our wallet, and we, we love them. We kiss them. We're not kissing paper. It's transferred to the image. So these become windows into heaven. They make visible and present the invisible. And that reminds us there's another world that we're a part of, and we're all headed there sooner or later, some sooner than later. But so it was. we can thank women for restoring icons. Empress Irene called the Seventh Ecumenical Council in 785. You know, historians, your seminarians will say, no, Father, it was 786. I say, yeah, you're right. She called it in 785, but there's such an uproar and tension, she had to postpone it a year. And that was when they resolved, yes, icons are an essential part of our theology and part of our church. And then the Emperor Theophilus came along and nixed it again for a while. And then Empress Theodora restored them for the last time. And now icons are celebrated on the restoration of icons, celebrated on the first Sunday of Orthodoxy, which is uh, first Sunday of Great Lent, which is tomorrow. And so we'll be proclaiming the essence and the importance of iconography. Now, we're going to leave you wanting more. So let me, these are stylistic things so you can understand the expressive nature and how things change over time visually. And this is interesting because this, we just saw a big shift. This was from the 12th century to the 13th century. This is Ayusophia, and I'd mentioned about the icon of Christ, 
the Virgin Mary and St. John being a they cease icon, and that would be here shorthand for Christ's second coming. And then once the empire fell and collapsed, you could no longer hang out in Constantinople and uh, make a living as an iconographer, so they went to the West. Some went to Crete, some went to Italy, and there was a renaissance of the understanding of the Byzantine perception. But because the patrons were from Venice, they were ship-faring people, they had the money, and they began to influence, and we began to lose the strictly Byzantine style. Now, if we go to Russia, say uh, Theophon the Greek, not the Cretan, the Greek, went to Kiev, and they're in the news these days, um, and taught uh, Andrei Rublev, now St. Andrei Rublev, and these are some of Theophon the Greek's work, and you can see it's a little different than the, the strict Byzantine style. It still has those elements, but now the figures are longer and taller and more dramatic. Still a Byzantine icon, still the same principles, just a little different. So uh, Andrei Rublev takes that and develops it, and he influences the development of iconography for the next 400 years uh, through his draftsmanship, through the theology, through the beauty of his work. So then these are some samples. Now that you're fluent in the language, you can see what it is and understand it and appreciate it a little better. This is a famous icon of an encaustic icon from Mount Sinai, 6th century, one of the rare icons that wasn't destroyed because of the iconoclastic period. It was far enough away, far enough away from the uh, center of power that they didn't get to this one. But it's very famous because if you cover up one eye, each eye looks like a totally different mood. His right eye, we would say, is a compassionate, loving eye. The other eye seems a little harsh. So it says truth and love combined in the same person, which Christ is, perfect truth and perfect love. All right. Different samples from different periods. And then this is how we make icons. Jessoed board, labor intensive. And we start out with a cartoon and trace it down. And that's my wife, Presbyteta Christine modeling and then we have gold gilding which is to make it look very beautiful rich expensive because we're talking about the kingdom of god and then we paint and we paint from the front from the back to the front in what's called this is a process style of painting in other words you follow this rhythm of painting back to front there's hard edges that's what makes it dynamic you're kind of you do the line drawing and then you create the form and that's what gives it that relational aspect. And this just shows, this is by my teacher, just shows how you do that and what power and control you have with one color, one hand of paint, the highlight. You start out with, in the eyes, you see the propolasmo or the base coat. And then by building up layer by layer by layer, starting at the high, highlight, building out to the shadow, you begin to develop the form. So this has five layers of the same coat of paint, letting the background show through, and we see how you're able to develop form. This is what I teach at our Liturgical Arts Academy, which is in August. If you know anybody that wants to learn to paint this way, I can teach them. I cannot make them a great iconographer, but I can teach them how to paint. God makes you a great iconographer. And Constantine can teach them how to chant, because that's his expertise, Dr. Constantine Kokinos. And Presbyter is the executive director, so we're all here. So if you know anybody or want to find out more about the Liturgical Arts Academy, you can ask us. Then this is the finished image. So you open it up to white highlights and all the way back to black, and that's what creates that relational dimension. And it's, it's really an economic way to paint, but it's also a very creative way to paint. So, And then we have some of the work that I've done over the years. All right, so I do want to say a few words about images, but I will say those upstairs just so you know what you're looking at. Any questions? Yes, Deacon Jim. It seems that the facial expression is always very solemn and... Uh... They're not smiling. Why aren't they smiling? Huh? Why aren't they smiling? Well, that's a good question. Why are they smiling? Eyes, uh, just seem to be so fixed. You know, 
It is. Um, yeah, the, 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 that expressive element is the relational element. First of all, smiling is an affective state affected state. You, you're feeling a certain emotion. But when you're all just sitting here, you look like icons. There's no expression on your face. You're just sitting there looking. What you can do is you can bring in sobriety. You can bring in wisdom. You can bring in joy. Uh, but not through affected states. And what happens is, this is an interesting thing that happens, that some of these icons, they look pretty severe, pretty serious looking, but in the hands of an inexperienced iconography, you can turn pious and sober into angry. And we're not after angry. We're after pious and sober. Okay? And I've been guilty of making angry looking saints. These aren't them, but... There's a church in Pensacola that I painted. Presbyterian, actually, I know when I painted that, it was on our 20th anniversary. And she still remembers it. I did a little bait and switch. I said we'd have a condo on the beach, which we did. But there was a hurricane coming, and uh, it rained the whole week, so she didn't, she didn't get much time on the beach, but she was a great help in helping me install this. Oh. And if you like, she will sing her fabulous hit, Never Marry an Artist. Um, she'll give you an indiv in individual performance. Um, any other questions? Yes. That is a good question. And he's not a plant. That's a good question. What relation, how free are we? Are we Xerox copies? We take a prototype and we reproduce it. Uh, I was in Romania a few years back for a symposium of iconographers from around the world and gathered to paint, to meet each other, but also to teach about, about iconography. And the title of the show was Modernity and Tradition. And George Corthys, who organized this, he didn't come up with that title, but he says, you know what, I don't like that title because it makes it look like we're contrasting modernity and tradition when it actually modernity is part of tradition, meaning we have to incarnate the faith where we are. We have to make it experiential and visible to the people today. But we're not reinventing the wheel. A train has tracks to take it someplace. It doesn't resent the tracks. Without the tracks, it wouldn't be able to travel. We have tracks. We have guardrails in iconography, things that show us how to, what needs to be there. So an icon of the resurrection, what does it need? It needs Christ with a cross. It needs the gates of hell that he has shattered. There's the keys, the locks. It needs Adam and Eve being raised from the tomb. It has the Old Testament, King David, King Solomon, uh, King Solomon John the Baptist, and the New Testament. They're all together. These are the elements that help convey the faith. We're not Picassos. We're not showing off. We're not making a name for ourselves. We're the Akoni. You can understand that, Deacon Jim. We're servants. We try and make visible the invisible, but we are persons. We are baptized in the tradition and we incarnate it for the faithful and for those to encounter the kingdom of God. And I always say we all have an accent. What does that mean? We incarnate the faith in a certain way, a certain place, a certain time. If you go to England, they'll all tell you, oh, you have an accent. And you say, oh, no, you have an accent. They say, no, you have an accent because you're not from here. This is the way we do it here. So we all incarnate the faith. So we are free to, in the tradition, paint. And that's what I do. I start out with a yellow ochre brush and I just start making big shapes. This is my guide. I'm borrowing heavily, but I'm not copying, so to speak. And if you go on the internet today, you'll find out what's, there's a lot of crazy things going on out there. People are having a really exceptionally deep insight into what iconography is and can be. Some of it goes a little too far. Some of it is, becomes 
that conceptual art that I was talking about with the air and the airplane might take, that might disincarnate the faith. You have to keep it here. You have to relate to your audience. You have to help them experience God's presence. That's your goal. So within that goal and within those elements that we were talking about earlier, you're kind of free to move about the cabin. I, I, when I was, uh, I was starting to feel like I know what I was doing and I, I decided, okay, I'm ready to venture out and I'm going to make my own icons. And I did and they were ugly. I said, eh, I guess I'm not quite ready. So I went back to learn from the masters. But when I hit 10,000 hours, they say 10,000 hours to master something. When I hit 10,000 hours, give or take three or four hours, suddenly I said, I know what I'm doing. I can create icons. I may not be the best iconographer in the world, but I've mastered it. I know what I'm doing. I have the confidence to help people encounter God, not in an egotistical way, but in a way that will make the visible, the invisible visible. So, good question. Does that answer your question? Yeah. More or less? Anybody else? Deacon Jim? The resurrection is a joyful event. Yes. But it doesn't seem to be joy on the faces of the, of the people in the icon. But there is in the color. Huh? There is in the color. Oh. The color says it all. Let me go back here for a second. I'll show you one that really... This is this captures the incarnation. And the top half of the icon is, there we go. The top half of the icon is actually the crucifixion. And they, these are in one icon. The top half is kind of dark and uh, pensive. The bottom half is this. And I said, that, that, that was a big culture. They knew the profoundness of the incarnation. They captured it in the joy and the beauty of the icon. So there's many different levels, and that's why I said the little story about the hand washing. There's many different levels. What happens is, if there's too much personality in either iconography or chanting or anything, like the church up the street from us, they had a struggle. There was a Baptist church. They had a struggle with new music. And the old people said, I don't like the new music. I like the old music. And the kids said, we're not coming to church. We don't like that music. So they changed the music. Well, the kids come now and the old people. My son, who was 17 at the time when we went to Yale, we gave a presentation up there out of which grew the Liturgical Arts Academy. But it was a, it was a, the program was passing the faith on to the next generation. So we all had to give a presentation. And ours was iconography and chant. And they asked Maximus, why are you still in the church? And he said, I'm in the church because everything around is changing. Everything around me is changing at a rapid rate. The church doesn't change. I go there to be changed by the church. And if there's too much personality in iconography or in music or too much personal expression, let's say, then you're free to go, eh, I don't like that. I'll go down here. But the work we do as iconographers and chanters is we pass on what we've received. Constantine, you want to make a comment? What style this? this is e Ethiopian Armenian, 13th century. And it has that very Eastern feel, very linear, very expressive. It, it does, but how is it Ethiopian Armenian? They weren't even geographically anywhere close to each other. That's what they told us. But, but look, at, look at the book of Kells, not even close to uh, Coptics, but they're the ones that influenced it because they were travelers. So the, the Book of Kells is not Byzantine by any stretch, what? strictly Coptic influence. Coptic. So Coptic, yeah, if you look at it. In Ireland. What's that? In, in, Ireland. in Ireland. The travelers, the monks, yeah, they I'm saw sure this stuff. Well, they, they, were biz they were business people, oh, traders, wow. and they had, you know, things with it. That's how it was influenced, so. All right, should we go upstairs? Just for a little gallery talk. I won't, won't be so long-winded. But any other questions? All right. Thank you for your patience. And uh... um, how did this happen? How did we get here? Just in a quick snapshot. Um, I was in a, 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 
as Van mentioned, I was a uh, artist. I was living the dream. I was studying at uh, University of Minnesota. You can sit down to Come on, get comfortable. And uh, and yeah, that's good. Yeah, I'm trying. Yeah, right. Keep talking. Okay. Be natural. Right. So I was on. I was just becoming orthodox. I graduated with a degree in industrial design. I was living in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I was going to start going to an Orthodox church. And I said, my, my first time I went, it was on a day there was a blizzard. There was the priest, the chanter, and three of us, because nobody could come. And it was a mystical experience. I said, who are you guys? You're not Catholic. You're not Protestant. I said, we're Orthodox. I said, what's that? I said, come and see. So I came and I saw. And I didn't stay because of theology or church history. I stayed because of the life of the community. And I just kept going. I kept going. And it was beautiful. And then one Sunday, and it happened to be an Easter Sunday, I was at home. And here I was an artist. I was exhibiting. I had a studio on the Mississippi. You know, living the dream. And God asks me, is art God or am I God? Ooh. I thought, oh, there it goes. So I said, I guess I have to go to seminary. So I took the application that I had on my counter for must have been eight months, and I sent it in, and I said, well, if I get accepted, I'll know it's God's will. Well, I didn't know they accepted everybody all the time, so <laughs> I don't know what that does for the sermon. Not a lot of people fly. All right. So, so, but, so I gave up art. And then at seminary, I met a man who was our, the center of our basketball team, and I found out he was an iconographer. Oh, that's Any help? I have a background in art. So he hired me. So we painted the cathedral in Cambridge together, and we painted a church in Cohasset, but he wouldn't teach me anything. Who was that? That was Nick Fatigue. Oh, Nick Fatigue. Great artist, great guy, but he wouldn't teach me anything. So. Presbyteria came to seminary, she studied, got a master's of theological studies, fell in love, and we got married. She hadn't written her hit song yet, Never Marry an Artist. <laughs> so we got married and we moved to Greece to learn the language, and then I began studying iconography and painting there. We, you know, six years later, two kids, and six years later, the honeymoon was over, and we came back. But in the meantime, what I did was I kept sketchbooks, and I kept playing in the sketchbooks, and then I'd write little sayings, and uh, there's a guy named uh, Brian Andreessen, who's done story people. If you've ever been in an airport around the world, he has little story people stories. And all his images kind of look the same, but the stories are just outrageous and funny. So I said, you know what? music, they get to do instrumentals, and the poets get to do poetry, and some people put them together. I said, why not art? Put in some funny sayings and paintings. So I never know where things are going to go. I just start playing. This section of work right here is, you'll see it says, Father Anthony and Company. That means I have help. I have two little curmudgeons that help me paint. And I get it out of their hands just when it's perfect, and then I finish it. And over here, these chairs and the things. We like to play. Constantine has more images. And he's my patron. If I have one patron, it's Constantine. He's got a lot of my work in his house. But President Ted and I, who uh, we decided, well, we have to look into this art thing and see, are we going to be entrepreneurial artists? So we went and took a class. And there were artists there, and there was Christine. And this person teaching the class told us you gotta do this, this, and this. And Christine probably says, Yeah, I do that. I do that. I do that. So by the end of the day, everybody said, You know, we need to be entrepreneurial artists. We all need a Christine. Because she knows how to do those things to keep you on track, to help you market, to keep track of billing, all those different things. So on the way home, we were talking, and we said, Do you really want to be entrepreneurial artists? I said, no, there's easier ways to make money. So I said, well, then I'm just going to, this is going to be a hobby. 
I'm going to be an amateur. I'm going to do it for the love of it. So my, this, what you're seeing is just my exploration, my journey, my vision, my practice. And then I share it on Instagram. So you can follow me on Instagram if you want to see. F.R. Andonios. It's written on these little cards. So I print these cards, and what I'm trying to do is just share the joy with everyone. And, and what we said earlier about being attentive, like my two altar boys, they're very attentive now to what's going on around them. You may not understand what I'm trying to say. It may be foreign to you. But isn't life like that? We don't understand everything. There's mystery in life. And what is mystery? The sacrament. Mysterium, the Greek word, when heaven and earth meet. So we want to try and encourage people to be a mystery, to have every element of their life a heaven and earth event. And that's what we're struggling for. That's what we're striving for. We're trying to reflect God's light into the world. And the only way we do that is by cleaning our own mirror, by constantly working on it to get shinier, to get a better reflective surface. So, Enjoy the art. So enjoy the art. <laughs> you don't need to hear me anymore. Go out and just enjoy the art. All right. Thank you for coming. <laughs>